Between 2003 and 2020, the region of Darfur was subjected to what has been dubbed the first genocide of the 21st century. Following years of oppression and strife, the Sudanese government unleashed brutal militias against a number of rebel groups. But in addition on taking on the rebels, entire villages and tens, possibly hundreds of thousands, were killed. Many more were displaced and countless subjected to serious SA. In today's video, we will cover the background to and the consequences of the first genocide of the 21st century. It is perhaps helpful to start with the situation in Sudan. Shortly after the country obtained independence from British and Egyptian rule in 1956, the country was beset by a civil war. It was rooted in the divides between the largely Arab Muslim population in the north and the Christian animist South Sudanese. During colonial rule, the north and south were ruled over as separate regions, with little mixing between the two. The focus was very much on development and investment in the north, with little going to the south. This led to the North gaining the bulk of the political and economic power in the region. In 1956, two key issues were not addressed during the country gaining independence. Whether the country was going to be a secular or Islamic state, and the rights of minorities. For many in the South, there was little in the way of political power or meaningful representation, meaning the ever-growing inequalities could not be addressed. For those in the North, many saw the agitations of the South as little more than residual resentment for the previous colonial regime. Some, however, feared a strong desire to overturn the North's long-existing rule now that the previous colonial powers had left. Between 1955 to 1972, and from 1982 until 2005, Sudan was engaged in a civil war, largely between the North and South. It is against this backdrop to near-constant war that we come to the situation in Darfur. Darfur is a region in western Sudan, and is home to around 6 million people from various tribes, both settled and nomadic. In general, the settled regarded themselves as Arab descent, while the nomadic see themselves as of black African descent, but the vast majority are Muslim. Before 1916, it remained a separate region, though was incorporated into the colony. Much like South Sudan, it was neglected in terms of investment or infrastructure. When Sudan gained independence in 1956, Darfur remained as part of the country. As part of the Greater Sudan, many in Darfur left as they were being ignored by the northern ruling elite. Much like the British before them, there was little investment in the region. The consequences for this can perhaps best be seen in the 1983 famine that struck Darfur. A lack of decent roads meant delivering aid was impossible to some regions, whilst resentment of the government led to riots over food insecurity. In all, some 100,000 Darfuris died during this famine. In 1989, Sudan was brought under the military control of General Omar al-Bashir, who came to power in a military coup. Bashir's government was very much focused on Arab nationalism and adopted a policy of Arabization in Darfur. Sharia law was imposed on the country and rival political parties were banned. In matters such as land or water disputes between the settled and nomadic tribes, it was those of Arab descent that were favoured over those of black African descent. The goal appeared to displace and limit the opportunities of the settled people of Darfur, with some even enslaved. As matters escalated, al-Bashir's government provided weapons to a number of Arab tribes, which only fueled the conflict. To top it all off, oil was discovered in western Sudan, which led to the redrawing of boundaries to better benefit the north, robbing Darfur of its natural resources. All of this led to accusations of an apartheid system taking hold in Darfur. By the early 2000s, a number of armed liberation groups had arisen to fight against the Sudanese government. Notably, the Sudan Liberation Army, SLA, and the Justice and Equality Movement, JEM. These organizations launched attacks against military bases and airfields, as well as engaging in hijacking of planes. In response, the Sudanese government backed a number of Arab militias called the Popular Defense Force, but more commonly known as the Janjaweed. The Janjaweed were made up of various Arab tribes, often supplied with weapons from the military. They often rode camels and horses, and whilst their name has been translated to devils on horseback, it could also refer to the fact that they were heavily armed. These forces fought alongside the Sudanese forces, or at least with very heavy weapons such as artillery, military vehicles, and even anti-aircraft guns. 
Many wore uniforms of the Sudanese army, and according to survivors, would arrive alongside with the actual Sudanese military. Some of the Janjaweed were not Sudanese, but had come from Chad, Niger, Mali, Cameroon, and possibly even further afield. The goal of these militias was to sow terror amongst the black Sudanese in Darfur, who made up the membership of the rebel groups. Key targets were the members of the Malasit and Fur tribes. They were, however, indiscriminate in their violence. Entire villages were targeted and wiped out. And whilst the villagers would attempt to defend themselves, they were often beaten. But this would not be the end of the matter. Often the Janjaweed would return to the village to ensure that nobody was left, and to ensure that the settlement would remain abandoned. Drinking wells would be rendered useless, what infrastructure existed would be destroyed, and food supplies burned. The surviving men and boys would often be summarily executed. The girls and women would be rounded up and subjected to horrendous SA. Often, it was reported that the women and children subjected to SA would be beaten to death afterwards, with some even subjected to mutilation. In many cases, family members, parents, and children were made to watch as their loved ones were assaulted. An example of this can be found in the words of one survivor named Mahasan. They confiscated our belongings, they took our livestock, they beat the men, and then they ripped us. They ripped us in a group. Some women were ripped by eight or ten men. All of us were ripped. Even the underage girls were ripped. The attack described took place in July of 2015, during what was termed as a counterinsurgency action named Operation Decisive Summer. This was undertaken by the Rapid Support Forces, who were government-backed groups largely formed of Janjaweed and working closely with the Sudanese Armed Forces. But such examples were typical of the methods of the Janjaweed, with reports of violence against civilians being widespread and systematic. The Sudanese government denied any such crimes were taking place. But by 2004, the United States had declared that a genocide was taking place in Darfur and pushed for further action. Following pressure from both the United States and United Nations, fighting stopped in July of 2006. This was followed up with the United Nations Security Council approving the formation of a United Nations Peacekeeping Force. This peacekeeping force was named the United Nations African Union Mission in Darfur, or the UNAMID. This, however, was flatly rejected by the Al-Bashir government, who launched a major offensive in September of 2006. With UNAMID numbering 26,000 soldiers and civilian workers, they were not able to protect civilians. Whilst the key mandate was to document crimes against humanity, the focus of their reporting was on displacement of civilians and not the widespread violence. General Martin Aguay, head of the UNAMID forces, declared that by 2009 there was little real conflict in the region. However, other reports would indicate that this was not the case. With much international attention, Al-Bashir was on borrowed time. The International Criminal Court launched an investigation, ultimately concluding that he was responsible for the genocide in Darfur. On the 14th of July 2009, he was indicted by the ICC, along with six other leading members of the regime for crimes against humanity, with further indictments for genocide coming in 2010. These indictments were ignored, though soon the tide started to turn against al-Bashir. Allegations of corruption and the embezzlement of around $9 billion led to many in Sudan launching protests against his rule. In 2019, al-Bashir was removed from office by a military coup and was placed under arrest. The new government sought to bring their own charges against al-Bashir, as well as seeking to establish a hybrid court with the ICC to bring him to justice. Whilst he was sentenced to two years imprisonment for corruption in 2019, he is yet to face trial for his crimes against humanity, with no clear indication as to when the trial, if ever, will begin. But this is far from the end of the story. A number of Bashir loyalists remained in the military, and in 2021 they were arrested for attempting to stage a coup. Former members of the Janjaweed remained in key positions of power, some within the Sudanese military, who are yet to face justice for their crimes. As you may have seen in recent news, members of the Rapid Support Forces have been engaged in fighting with the Sudanese government, with fears of another civil war erupting. It is always interesting to look at the historical factors to current issues. 
In all, it is thought that some 200 to 400,000 people were murdered in Darfur. Most were targeted for their ethnicity by the Arab descent militias, working closely with the Sudanese military. The use of SA has been described as genocidal by a number of observers. Hundreds of thousands more were displaced, many fleeing to neighbouring Chad. But the level of destruction levered against the people of Darfur has made the rebuilding of the region difficult. Links will be pinned in the comments for those who wish to read further. The genocide in Darfur is the first genocide to have taken place during the 21st century. Already, you may be thinking of the subsequent genocides that have taken place since, such as in Myanmar or in Yemen. Whilst this channel tends to focus on the crimes of the 20th century, it is important to look into the more recent examples of such crimes against humanity. Too often, we can believe that such crimes are relics of a different time, though in reality, they occur well within even our youngest viewers' lifetimes. The genocide in Darfur deserves to be remembered, due to the brutal levels of violence involved, how it was largely resource-driven, and how the path to justice for the victims is a long, arduous process.